Hi, this is Eric for Ochoy. In this video, we're going to go over working with the direct lighting render kernel in Octane for Maya. So the scene I'm using for this example is the muscle ship MA scene. So kind of like a muscle car version of a spaceship in this simple spaceport setting. Uh, this ship was created by Jeff Homan for this video series. Uh, so you can see we got a few other props in here, um, as well as an HDRI lighting. Uh, so it's a basically a pretty simple scene. So it's a good example that should work for demonstrating the principles of the direct lighting kernel. The direct lighting kernel is one of the three major render kernels in Octane for Maya that allows you to render uh, with lighting, shading, and reflections, and so on to make these nice, beautiful images and animations. The direct lighting render kernel is not as physically accurate as the other render kernels, PMC and path tracing, but it is easy to use, it's very fast, and in certain situations you can get a very nice looking render out of it, like in this scene right here. So the materials in this scene are largely metallic or reflective. We also have some emissive uh, surfaces creating light in the scene. So there's not a whole lot of refraction. There are not caustic effects that generally would require something like path tracing or PMC. So it's a good example of a scene that benefits from direct lighting. So how do we get to the direct light render kernel settings? Let's go into the render settings window here. And under kernel, I've created a kernel called Octane Kernel 1. So I'll choose it and click on this arrow here to open up the attribute editor and go into the settings for direct light render kernel. So within the settings, I'll set the kernel type to direct light and then take a look at the max samples here. So I have this set to 5,000. And uh, if you look down towards the bottom here, you can see that we're at about 1240 samples and it already looks pretty good. So 5,000 is probably higher than we need. So let's set the max samples down to 1,000 and see how that works. We also have a filter size that can help reduce noise and artifacts, but will make the scene look very soft. You can see as I increase it, the scene looks very soft and kind of blurred out. That's not depth of field blurring, that's uh, filter size. So you want to use that uh, carefully. The Ray Epsilon setting, and I should point out that both these settings apply to all kernels, all these three settings right here. But uh, I do want to point them out because they're very important. The Ray uh, Epsilon setting is uh, important to work with if you're if you're rendering a scene that is very large in terms of space not necessarily in terms of number of polygons but let's say the distances between objects is very large you can sometimes start to see artifacts uh, like maybe shearing or some kinds of uh, lines that might appear in your surfaces when that happens you can adjust this you can increase it and that should reduce those render artifacts pretty quickly uh, in some cases, it can affect the overall look of the render. So if I set this to 100, you can see a slight change. Things look a little bit brighter. If I bring it down to, say, 0, you can see it looks a little bit darker. We're not having too many render artifacts in this scene, but um, when you encounter them, you know that's the first place to go to see if you can troubleshoot and reduce them. Just uh, be aware that changing these values can affect kind of other elements in the scene. Um, so I usually start with raising it up to like a value of one, see if the render artifacts start to go away. And if that's fine, then I'll just leave it there. Otherwise, I'll increase it in small increments until the render artifacts uh, disappear. These two settings are also available for all the render kernels. Pretty uh, straightforward. Alpha channel, if this is turned on, means that here within the render view, we won't see that background image. Instead, we get to see uh, an alpha channel. So the lighting from the uh, HDR image is still apparent. It's just not, the uh, HDR image is not visible in the render. Uh, you can see that there is some artifacting here within the uh, edges of these objects here. However, when you render this out and take a look at the alpha channel in, say, Photoshop or compositing software, those, uh, that aliasing disappears. It's not part of the actual alpha channel itself. So there's just a little bit of bleed there. So don't panic if you see that here in the render. Um, I'm going to turn this back off. The alpha shadow means that transparent objects like windows, if this is turned on, they will cast shadows correctly, so the light will pass through them and you'll see that in the shadows. If you turn this off, then that means that um, light passing through transparent uh, surface, that transparent surface will leave a black shadow as if it was a, a solid object. So pretty straightforward option here. You're not going to see much of a difference in this particular render. So let's talk about the direct light render kernel settings, which are found here in the direct light rollout. 
since the kernel is set to direct light, we only have to worry about these settings. We don't have to worry about anything under path tracing, PMC, or info channel unless we change the kernel type. So the first settings we want to take a look at are the depth settings, specular depth, glossy depth, and diffuse depth. So as a scene is rendering in Octane, rays are being shot into the scene and they're bouncing off of the various surfaces and reacting with the materials. These depth settings control or allow you to fine tune the number of times that these rays bounce around off of various types of surfaces in order to achieve a, a better result. So specular depth controls the number of uh, rays that are bounced off of uh, transparent surfaces or surfaces that refract light. So the windows here on the spaceship are actually transparent. They're also very reflective, so we're seeing sort of the reflection of the scene in here. But if I set this down to zero, you'll see immediately that these surfaces turn black, as well as the other transparent surfaces on the other objects in the scene. So as I increase this, we'll start to get higher quality of refractions uh, within the scene, but we'll also add to render time. So in a scene like this, where we don't have a whole lot of refraction going on, it might be a good idea to keep this fairly low. Uh, if we increase it, we may not see a whole lot of a difference here in the render, but we do add a little bit to render time there. So we could probably keep this down to, let's say, just four to be somewhat conservative. Glossy depth controls the number of times rays bounce off reflective surfaces. So the windows here are both transparent and reflective at the same time. Uh, low values here can uh, uh, create less realistic results, especially you can see here in the metal, and often can all contribute to artifacts in the scene. Since we do have a lot of reflective surfaces in this scene, we probably want to keep this above four. You don't have to go too crazy, but if I really start to raise it, you once you don't notice a difference anymore, then you don't probably don't need to raise it any more than that. So 345 is a bit ridiculous. Let's set this down to something like 8. The diffuse depth is a similar concept. It just controls the number of times rays bounce off diffuse surfaces. So there's not a whole lot of diffuse surfaces in here. Uh, even the ground, I think, is a ground, glossy shader. But if we increase this, you may not see a whole lot of a difference but we will add to render time. So if you're rendering a scene, say for instance, that was in like, like a stone temple or something like that, where you have a lot of diffuse surfaces, a lot of shadows, you might want to increase this to reduce the number of artifacts. If you have a scene like this one, which is mostly reflective surfaces, then you probably don't need to keep this terribly high. Let's set it down to four and see if that makes much of a difference. To demonstrate the difference between the various GI modes, I've switched over to the Space Cantina interior scene. Uh, since this is most obvious in interior scenes when you have lighting coming from area lights or large emissive surfaces like in this scene. So we have three different modes, none, ambient occlusion, and diffuse, and they kind of go in order of quality. So none basically means that only direct lighting is calculated and we don't see any bounce light in the shadows or in the recessed areas. So you can see the result right here. Renders fast but does not look terribly realistic. So this is a good mode for testing when you're setting up lights or, or that sort of thing. Then we have ambient occlusion, which creates shadows in the recessed areas using kind of a standard ambient occlusion uh, calculation. Again, not super accurate, but can look nice uh, for different scenes if you're doing kind of maybe testing or you just want to get a very basic looking render without spending a whole lot of time on it. Uh, you can, of course, change the AO distance. The default is 3. If I set this up to 20, you're going to see more uh, shadowing in the recessed areas as the distance uh, is, is, is increased, so the shadow spreads over a larger distance. And then, of course, if we switch to diffuse mode, we get the most accurate results, and a lot of times this can look uh, very nice and uh, is also great for rendering out animations since it does render uh, very quickly. The diffuse GI mode is the most physically accurate of the uh, direct light kernel options. So it's not as physically accurate as the path tracing kernel or the PMC kernel, but it's better in, than, say, the uh, ambient occlusion GI mode or the none GI mode. Uh, so it's kind of like a brute force rendering method that you might encounter in other uh, types of rendering software. Again, as I mentioned before, we have diffuse depth, which can then control how many times uh, a ray bounces uh, off of diffuse surfaces before it's extinguished. So increasing this will also increase the quality, but also increase render time.
The settings found under Diffuse Depth allow you to balance render time with render quality. So for path termination power, if you increase this, your render will be faster, but you'll find that there's more noise in the shaded areas. So I'm going to put this back to default value of 0.3. And Coherent Ratio will also increase render speed if you raise it, but it also can in introduce uh, kind of blotchiness and noise into the render. So again, use these cautiously, but they're nice to kind of play with if you're trying to eliminate noise in the shadow areas. Set this down to 0.1, and let's set this up to 0.5 just to see how it looks. The static noise option creates a noise that is sort of consistent from one frame to the next. So if you're rendering an animation, uh, it can help to reduce uh, render time, but at the same time, it might look like there's, if there's too much noise in the render, it could look like there's kind of like a piece of gauze in front of the camera. The parallel samples and the max tile samples both control how the render is calculated on your machine depending on your GPU architecture. So they might not affect the quality of the render, but they can help speed up render times uh, if you uh, alter these values. But again, it's going to vary from one machine to another. Uh, I have two Titan cards on this machine, so I'm going to try raising them and see if that actually affects the render much in terms of the render time. What I can do is I can, uh, change the camera angle here just a little bit. The minimize net traffic is a setting that applies only if you're going to be rendering on a network across multiple GPUs. Deep image, uh, which will be covered in another video, uh, allows you to render with uh, depth information so that you can work with depth information in compositing if you're using Nuke or After Effects or something like that. And then of course the maximum depth samples controls the number of samples used when rendering a deep image. The depth tolerance slider is also used in conjunction when rendering uh, with deep images turned on. The ambient occlusion texture and the slider are used when rendering with the ambient occlusion GI modes. If I set this to ambient occlusion and I go down here, if I move the slider all the way up to one, then essentially the white color is being used in the ambient occlusion shading. It's a little bit more obvious if I add a texture. So if I set that back to zero, click on this checker box to bring up the create render node window, and then add say RGB spectrum texture. I'll set this to green then it becomes really obvious how the uh, ambient occlusion shadowing has been tempted by this uh, green color. This could be used as a diagnostic tool to see how the ambient occlusion shading is being calculated within the scene. So for example, if I go up here and I'm going to set my ambient occlusion distance to say 500, you can see with that green tint is indicating how the ambient occlusion shading is being applied to the scene. So. Uh, could be an interesting feature there, or just a way to tint the ambient occlusion shadowing if you wanted to do that for whatever reason. So I'm going to break this connection. The tune shadow ambient is similar and works in conjunction with tune shading, which will be covered in uh, a later video. And then finally, the irradiance mode, if I turn that on, it's kind of like a removes the textures and just renders with sort of a clay, uh, clay shader applied or diffuse shader. And uh, this allows you to kind of see or diagnose the lighting in the scene, uh, where you might encounter a noise, uh, diagnosing the shadow quality, and so on. So uh, that could be a very useful diagnostic tool. It also can allow you to render a little bit quicker. If I switch to diffuse uh, GI mode while I still have a radiance mode on, you can sort of see uh, it's a great way to diagnose uh, issues within the render when using a different uh, GI mode. So I switch back to the muscle ship scene just to demonstrate how the uh, keep environment option works. And it's a little bit easier to see if I switch over to the render view. I'll choose render snapshot camera one and do a nice IPR render. So as I mentioned before, if I go up here and turn on alpha channel, the environment is invisible even though it's still lighting the scene. And if I take a look at the alpha channel, here's the alpha channel and here's, here's RGB, and just like I mentioned before, you see this aliasing here on the edges. If I turn on the alpha channel, you can see it's, it's nice and soft there, so that aliasing isn't part of the render. 
However, if you wanted to, say, save the image with an alpha channel, but you do want to have the environment visible, then you can turn on Keep Environment. So this way, the environment is visible, but if I look at the alpha channel, it still has an alpha channel. If I have Keep Environment off, actually, let's do it this way. If I turn off alpha channel and I look at the alpha channel, everything's white, no alpha channel. So I turn on alpha channel, now I have an alpha channel. But if I look at RGB, I don't have an environment. So now if I turn on Keep Environment, and I look at the alpha channel, I have an alpha channel here, but I also have the environment visible in the image. So uh, a lot of words there to explain a fairly simple concept, but uh, it's one of those things that can lead to a lot of head scratching if you're trying to render out an alpha channel using the IPR uh, renderer and you can't get it to work the way you want it to. So it's those settings. So that covers the basics of working with the direct light kernel. In the next video, we'll take a look at the path tracing kernel.